let me start by this. I want to have you make a change to your diet. I want you to cut out all the red meat for four weeks, and then I want to have you come back and see if anything's changed. So the man said, okay. He left. He comes back four weeks later, <clears throat> and the doctor says, is there any change to those issues you were having? And then he says, no, doc. No changes at all. Everything's the same. The doctor's like, huh. So he thinks about it, and he says, well, what changes did you make? And the patient said, Mom did exactly what you told me to do. I stopped putting ketchup on all my meat. <laughs> but I still use it for my fries. Maybe that's the problem. So church, often we are told how to improve ourselves, but we don't do anything with it. If we're given instruction, but then when we receive this instruction, this knowledge, and we don't change, it is no good for us. Because knowledge without implementation is useless. That's your first blank in your notes there. Knowledge without implementation is useless. Wouldn't you like to know the secret of life? The knowledge of how we can have peace all the time, of how we can realize and understand what our meaning in life is. But if you had this knowledge, what would you do with it? Would you be like the man in the story and completely miss the point? Would you say, oh, that's really good stuff, but then go about your business because you don't really want to change? Or would you realize that it's a gift that you were given and then act on it? You know, if we're honest, most of the time, even when we have the instructions we need to change, we think we know better. Even when the advice we're given us, we know is good, positive advice will help, we think we have a better way like this story. Somewhere up north when it's cold, kind of like today, but like 10 times colder all the time, there was a van, an ambulance rushing a man to a hospital for a medical emergency. And on the way there, it hit a patch of ice, spun out, and got stuck into a ditch. Well, a 4x4 four four was driving by, and the guy's like, Psh, I got this. Pulls over, hooks his truck up, tries to pull the ambulance out, but it can't get any traction, and it fails. Well, luckily, this is a community that has a large Amish community there. And so an Amish man was driving by in a horse-drawn buggy and knowing the capability of his horses, he offered to help. <laughs> well, the drivers of both the ambulance and the truck just laughed at him. They figured, ah, what's it going to hurt? Plus, we can watch this guy make a fool out of himself. Well, the Amish man, Amish man hooked his horses up to the ambulance and pulled it out of the ditch. See, sometimes the new way isn't the better way. Sometimes the new way isn't the better way. What are we going to do about the things that we're told? When we're given information, what are we going to do today? And, and, and when we get the information of how to change, how to have meaning and peace, will we use it? Now, today we're going to learn about something that's worked for a long time. It has a track record of working, a way to have peace and meaning. But see, the problem is, People don't always want, a, want the old way. They want a new and easier way. And when opportunists find out that there's something people are looking for, what do they do? They capitalize on it, right? They're like, oh, I can make some money on this. I can become famous. So, of course, there are a ton of self-help books out there, seminars on what we can do, how we can be better. Everyone has a new way of how to attain happiness, meaning, purpose. But with all these different ways to fix people, is it really helping? You know, in, a, in a, an article in Time magazine, it, it says that in 2016, 31% of Americans were happy. 31% of Americans were happy in 2016. And then in 2017, it's 2% higher, 33% of Americans we're happy. Now, I don't have the st stats since then, but let's just say the trend keeps going. That means next week in 2020, there will be 39% of Americans will be happy. So with all these different methods of helping out there, why aren't more people happy? The problem is these things are not getting to the root of the problem. They're just trying to change your perspective. They say, well, if you look at it this way, your life really isn't 
that bad. It doesn't fix the problem, therefore, it can't be the true answer. And you probably guessed it, today, I have the answer. And you can too. You see, Jesus is the only one who can change your life. But I want to warn you, if you learn the answer and do nothing with it, that's on you. Knowledge without implementation is useless. So let's open our books up, our Bibles up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now the Bible's broken into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament is about the last quarter or um, fourth of the Bible. And Mark is the second book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark. One of the four Gospels that talks about Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> now, as we read this, uh, it will be up on the screen. If you don't have a copy, you can grab the paperback underneath your, your seat. We're on page 569. Uh, it's in the paperback Bible. But as we read this, I want to invite you to uh, take whatever posture God leads you to. Stand, sit, kneel as we read his word. But let's read Mark chapter 1. We're going to read the whole thing. Here we go. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, One who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, Jesus that is, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. After John was arrested, John the Baptist, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. This is Jesus' words. The time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee... He saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed God. Going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went into Capernaum, and right away he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. They were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority, and like the, unlike the scribes. Just then a man with an unclean spirit was in their synagogue. He cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw him into convulsions, shouted with a loud voice, and came out of him. They were all amazed, and so began to ask each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him? At once, the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he, Jesus, went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. When the evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all of those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick 
with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there. This is why I have come. He went into all of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out de demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. He went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places and they came to him from everywhere. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the facts in here that we can, that we can learn about Jesus, about his life, about what he did and about how people reacted to him. And God, we ask today that you will help us to react that same way. Because Jesus, we know that you are the Son of God and that you are powerful. We believe in you and we want to serve you. So help us to draw close to you today. And Father, I ask that as I think and as I speak, that you will form the thoughts and the words that come out, that they will be of you and not me. Move me out of the way that your message is heard today. And Holy Spirit, help us to understand your message. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So why all this talk about change today? Well, what better time? What's going on on Wednesday? The new year is starting, and I bet a lot of people here are going to have a New Year's resolution. So I figured I could help you out by talking about it, giving you an idea of what you could do. And even more than that, we're starting the new year today with a new sermon series going through the gospel of Mark. We're going to walk through this gospel over the next 16 weeks, and each day we will read the whole chapter. You can get ahead of us if you want, because we'll be in chapter 2 next week. And so if you're with us every single week, you'll have read through the whole book of Mark in the next 16 weeks. Now here's a few details of the gospel of Mark. It is the shortest gospel... Maybe one of the reasons why we chose it. Now, now and then, Mark doesn't go into detail where some of the other Gospels do. So we might draw in some of those details to fill in the blanks. But for the most part, we'll stay in the book of Mark. And in this chapter we just read, the first chapter, one of the themes we saw throughout it is Jesus changing people's lives. And I want you to know that he can change yours too. So let's jump in and let's talk about how. I'm not going to read all the verses again, but we're going to, I'm going to call out a few verses, a, a passage, if you will, and we're going to break them down a little bit. So verses 1 through 3, any notes that I say that uh, connect with you, you can write them down in your sermon notes. There's lines there for that. Verses 1 through 3, this is the prophecy from the Old Testament that tells of the coming of John the Baptist. See, we talked last week about, about um, most, uh, messianic prophecies about Jesus. This is one about John the Baptist. Now, to be accurate... I have to point out that, that, uh, that these passages aren't only from Isaiah. It's not just Isaiah chapter 3, but he also uses Malachi verse, uh, chapter 3 verse 1. So verse 2 is Malachi and verse 3 is from Isaiah. And if you keep reading on in Malachi and you get to chapter 4, you'll see that this prophecy is about Elijah, about the return of Elijah. And Mark doesn't come out and say it in the book, but from the description of John, it's pretty clear that he believes John is also fulfilling this prophecy of the coming of Elijah. Now, if we go down to verses 4 through 8, we see John the Baptist doing exactly what that prophecy said he would do. He's coming before Jesus, and he's preparing a way for him. And in verse 5, we can see that John appealed 
to a very wide range of people. Did you catch that? To the country folk, to the city folk, they were all coming and listening to what he had to say. They were all coming to be baptized in the Jordan River. Now, John didn't believe that he had all the answers. He knew that he didn't. We see him consistently telling people that someone else is going to come who is greater than me. And at one point in the, in the book of John, in chapter 3, when Jesus was there, when he came about, John's followers, they were worried that Jesus was stealing the spotlight from him. And John set them straight. He told them, he must increase, talking about Jesus, and I must decrease. See, John knew his place. And it was to point people to Jesus. He was saying, Jesus is here. It's all about him and not me. That's what he was preparing people for. And then go down to verse 9 through 11. Here we see what happened when John baptized Jesus. This is, this is huge, okay? We see that the heavens opened. We see the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus. And we audibly hear God speaking, calling Jesus his son. Now, now here's the breakdown, okay? The, the heavens being torn open was God revealing that we will have access to heaven and God through Jesus the way it was meant in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Direct access, access with God through Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit descending down as a dove. This was a sign of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You have to, hear, you have to realize the connection here is that in the Old Testament, prophets received the Holy Spirit to begin their ministry. The Holy Spirit wasn't here like it comes in Acts a few books later. It wasn't here for everybody in the Old Testament. It wasn't like that. So they would receive it when they began their ministry. Now, Jesus being God already had this. So this was a sign that people would understand that he is now beginning God's ministry that he had preordained for him to do. Jesus was now doing what he was meant for, as he said himself. <clears throat> Now, the last part of that was God's voice saying who Jesus was. This is God affirming, this is my son. Again, it's a foreshadowing of what everyone will come to know. Now, through all of these, through, through all of these verses, there are many Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled. There's too many for us to go into right now. But know that all these three things had significance that draw back to the Old Testament. Testament. Now let's look at verses 12 and 13. In chapter 4 of the Gospel of Matthew, we see a lot more detail about what happened in 12 and 13. But again, since that's not Mark, we're not going to go into those details. But just know that it was part of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It was that preparation, that starting. And then when Jesus came back from being in the desert for 40 days, it, it hit hard. It was on like Donkey Kong. It, it started getting crazy, as we see. In verse 14 and 15, we see Jesus calling people to repentance, repentance and to believing in the good news. Up in verse 4, John called people to be baptized for repentance and forgiveness of sins. But here in 14, 15, Jesus is adding to that. He's adding that you need to believe in the good news. And it's interesting because you know how I love to do the word plays. Here it is. The phrase good news in the original Greek is euangelion. Euangelion. This means God's good news to humans. One word meant all that. Good news is euangelion. God's good news to humans. We'll unpack that a little more in a bit. And then verses 16 through 20... Jesus is now beginning his ministry. And the first thing he does, he calls men to train. He calls Simon, Andrew, James, John, two sets of brothers. And he tells these men, who are fishermen by trade, he says, I will teach you to fish for people. Now, think about being a fisherman for a second. How many of you have ever fished? Wow, that's a lot of people. So you have to know a lot to be a good 
fisherman, to be a professional fisherman. Some of the things you need to know is where do the fish like to be? You got to know the temperatures of the water and how deep they're going to be depending on what you're fishing for. They like to hide underneath things. What kind of bait? What kind of nets? You need to take care of your equipment. There are tons of things that being a fisherman needed to know to be called a fisherman. I fished. I'm not a fisherman. And I can say that about many of you too. You're not a fisherman. That was their trade. So when Jesus says, I will teach you to fish for people, he's saying, I'm going to teach you all these things that you know about fishermen. I'm going to teach you how to, how to reach people that same way, that in-depth way. And notice that they didn't question him. They didn't go, are you sure you know how to do that? No, no, see, they left everything they had and they went right away. And then look at verse, verses 21 through 34. We see Jesus teaching with authority. Even more so than the usual teachers that they had heard. And the people took notice, didn't they? They're like, wait, what is this? This is a new thing? He, he knows what he's talking about? He is so confident? Especially this this certain man who was possessed by a demon. The demon knew Jesus. He knew who he was. He knew he was God's son. And he proclaimed it to everyone there. He's like, hey, I know who you are. And what did Jesus do? Jesus shut him down. He's like, whoa, hey, get out. Cast the demon out of the man. And cause those people to take more notice. Who is this guy this begins a string of miracles mostly healings some more removing evil spirits and notice that they tend to start with jesus teaching if you look at that trend it starts with jesus teaching and then people come see jesus knows that his message will bring change and people responded and they responded in huge Crowds. And then we look at thir- verses 35 through 38. We can't gloss over the fact that Jesus knew how important it was to spend time with God the Father in prayer. He often would do this. We see it throughout Scripture. He would go away. He would try to remove distractions, go to a secluded place, and try to get rid of as many distractions as he could. But the disciples still found him and said, everybody's looking for you. They all want to see you. They were seeking after Jesus. So in 39 to 45, we see Jesus goes to preach to them. And while doing so, a man with leprosy approached. And what happened? Jesus was moved with compassion. Now we see a little bit of why Jesus is doing the things we're doing. If you miss that, it's so important. He had compassion, a deep care for every one of these people. It wasn't just this one. He had a deep care, compassion for all people. And that was part of his motivation. And also notice that Jesus knew it was not time to make his deity known So multiple times we see where he tried to keep a lid on it. But eventually he couldn't. The message got out, and it was so enticing that people came and came and came, and Jesus had to leave the city. He couldn't stay there. He had to go out in the wilderness, out out in the countryside, and, and teach there because there were so many people. Now, I know that I kind of ran through some of that, but... I think a lot of it is pretty self-explanatory, but I think this next part we're going to talk about needs a little bit more time. So now what? Now that we read the passage and we see what it meant for those people, what does it mean for us? Well, here's the thing. Point number one is this. The disciples trusted. The disciples trusted Jesus. As far as we understand These men didn't know anything about Jesus. We don't see that in here. Yet, they realized that something was different with this man. 
they realized that he wasn't like all the other people. I mean, why else would they have made such a drastic life change other than that? They dropped everything. They didn't look back. They moved and did what Jesus called. There was something about this guy that drove them to change their lives. Now, they were human, so I know if it was me, I'd have been like, okay, he's calling me, it's a new opportunity, it's exciting, I'll go check it out. I'll see what he's doing, I'll see what he's selling. If it's good, I'll stick around. If not, I'll go back to my other life. I can always do that, no problem. But guess what? They stuck around. They didn't leave. They listened to Jesus' teaching. They recognized his authority. And they continued to see sign after sign. They trusted Jesus and they were devoted to him. Now church, to be honest, we have what they didn't. We have the complete story from beginning to end. We can fast forward and rewind in it. We can see the connections between passages and between books. We can compare, compare themselves. Um, we, we can even look at how the Old Testament paved way for the New Testament. But they didn't have any of this. I mean, they had the Old Testament, they had the law, but they didn't have the story of Jesus. So here's the thing. If, if these fishermen could trust Jesus with so little... And why is it that we struggle trusting him with so much more? If they could leave everything they had, their whole lives, their families, and follow Jesus, why do we struggle to make changes to our daily lives, to our current lives? I can't answer that question for Lee. Only you can answer that one. And you have to decide, am I truly trusting Jesus? Why can't I make these changes? Am I really 100% devoted, fully devoted to Jesus? Think about it for a second. Where are you in that scale? What percentage are you devoted to him? Because I can tell you, 100 is what he wants. He don't, doesn't want you to just pass with a D. He doesn't even want you to, to meet standards with a B. He wants 100%. And, and you have to ask yourself, why am I where I am? Why am I at this place? And what can I do to get to the next step? Let me help you with that. Let's look at point number two. The people believed. The people believed in Jesus. Again, look at the beginning. What did they know of Jesus? He taught a loving message. Now, we haven't seen that in Mark yet, but we know that from the Gospels. We know that he was teaching, and he was teaching a loving message. And he did miracles. There were signs. That's all they knew. That's all they had to go on. And just like the disciples, they didn't have the rest of the story like we do, but they believed they knew this man was different he's different from anyone else they had ever encountered and because of that they brought more and more people and the word spread like wildfire church are you are you going around telling people about what you don't like or do you go around telling people what you do like here we go. Coke or Pepsi? Raise your hand if you're a Coke person. Raise your hand if you're a Pepsi person. Okay, okay. McDonald's or Burger King? Raise your hands if you're a McDonald's person. Raise your hand if you're a Burger King person. Raise your hand if you don't eat fast food. Something wrong with you. <laughs> the doctor told you to stay away from it, I guess. That's okay. How about this one? U of A or ASU? No, never mind. I don't, want anybody, I don't want anybody to get jumped in the parking lot. So, <clears throat> There are many things in life that you choose one over the other. And why? Because you like one more. You believe one is 
better. And guess what? You promote what you like. You encourage people to like it too. You don't promote what you don't like because you don't believe in it. This is why more and more people came to Jesus because people were promoting him because they believed in him. Not only did they like the message, but they believed it. And the message spread far and quickly. And the new people had to see what was going on, so they came, they believed, and then they went and got more people and brought them. See how that works? So do you believe? I'm not asking do you believe that God exists. I'm not asking do you believe in the Bible. I'm asking do you truly believe the gospel message so much that you are telling others about it? So much that it is contagious. You can't hold it in and you have to let people know. Are you promoting the kingdom to further its reach? Are you encouraging others to come and try it? If these people could do it with so little information, why do we struggle to do it with so much? There's no argument that the biggest reason that we don't do this is because we're afraid of people's reactions. We don't want to get rejected. Now, I don't want to discount this because it is a real issue. But have you ever thought about the fact that it's not you they're rejecting? It's the message. Remember that. The next time you feel prompted to tell someone about your faith, to tell someone about what God did to you, to share the gospel. Remember that you're being obedient. And if they don't want to hear it, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting the message. I know when I finally started realizing that, it helped me to not worry so much about what people thought. Now check this out. When the disciples trusted and the people believed, number three, Lives were changed. Lives were changed. They all had a choice to make. And when they did, oh man, Jesus did not disappoint. He opened the disciples' eyes to see things they had never seen. The people saw healing and heard teachings in a way they had never heard it before and this can be the same for us remember teaching is only effective when applied we, we, we can come to church every Sunday and Wednesday and we can read our Bibles and pray every day but if we don't apply God's word what have we accomplished with it remember knowledge without implementation is useless. We must apply what we learn and let it change our lives. And if we let it, it will. Do you think that the people that came to Jesus, do you think they had it all figured out? No. No, they were looking for something. They were looking for answers. The crazy thing is they probably didn't even know what they were looking for. They were just searching. And, and maybe you're here today and you don't know what you're looking for either. But understand this. We are made to be in harmony and communion with God. We are made to connect with Him. And if we don't have a relationship with Jesus, we can't live how we were made. So maybe you feel like things aren't complete in your life, maybe you feel like something's missing, like you're meant for something more, and that's because you need to make a change. You need to trust and believe in Jesus, just like the disciples and the people did. Trust and believe in Jesus, because only Jesus can help us be complete. Only Jesus can make us whole. 
Only Jesus can give us true meaning. Only Jesus can really, truly change our lives. And as we enter into a time of response in just a moment, the band's going to come, and we're going to sing a couple songs. But this time is for you to respond to God. God has been talking to you. Maybe it's a whisper. Maybe he's screaming at you. But God is talking to you. And he wants you to respond to what he's saying. And let me give you three ways that I suggest that you could respond. The first one is, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you've never done what Jesus said, if you haven't repented and believed, you can do that today. It doesn't matter where you've gone. It doesn't matter how far away from God you think you are. It doesn't matter the things that you've done. He loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. He just says, could you please just repent and believe? Repent just means turn away. Say, I'm a sinner. I want to turn away from my sin, and I want to turn to you, Jesus. And believe, God, I believe that you are the one true God, and Jesus is your son. And I want you to rule my life. Repent and believe it's that easy. God can change your life, and he wants to if you let him. The second way you can respond is if you, if you have a relationship, but you realize today that you haven't trusted and believed like you should, you now have that knowledge, and you need to apply it. But if you haven't, it's your chance to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've wasted this much time. I'm sorry that I have not applied the knowledge you've given me, and help me to apply it. Help me to be truly changed by you and to bring others to you. And then the third way is simply this. If, if you're on track, if you're like, I've trusted, I've believed, I'm obeying, I'm in a good way, I want to ask you this. Are you discipling someone? <clears throat> Jesus modeled this for us. The first thing he did is he grabbed some guys. He said, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Are you doing that? Are you following his model? Are you bringing people who don't know what you know, who aren't as far along in their faith as you are, and saying, let me help you get to a better place? That's what we should be doing. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to pray. And as I do, I want you to simply ask, don't listen to me. Say, God, show me how you want me to respond in these next moments. Let's pray together. Father God, First of all, God, we love you and we thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son, for sending him here that can be, to be a model for us. And God, we know we have your word to teach us what to do. And so God, I ask that you will help us to implement that. And I pray right now in this moment, speak to each and every one here what you want their next steps to be for you. Because we know that you have never called us to be complacent where we are but to always be moving towards you. So God, we thank you for amazing grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we have salvation. So help us to draw closer to you and to continue to bring people in. And these next moments, speak to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.